Okay, hello everyone. Um, for the people at home, I'm John Newbury. I work on Bitcoin Core. Um, this talk is going to be mostly about Bitcoin Core 0 0.17, which was branched, I think, on Monday. Um, and hopefully the final release will be in the next couple of weeks. Um, who am I? Well, I live in New York and work at Chaincode. Um, you can probably hear that I'm not actually a native-born New Yorker. Um, so it's very nice to be back in London and talking to you guys about Bitcoin. Um, I also know that Michael started this group, London Bitcoin Devs, inspired by the SF Bitcoin Devs, which itself was inspired by BitDevs NYC. So uh, you have a BitDevs NYC number of two, and it's nice to be here. Um, like I said, I work at Chenko Labs, which is probably best described as a uh, non-commercial research and development lab. Um, maybe that's a bit pompous, but it's basically what we do. Um, I started Bitcoin Optech earlier this year. Hey guys. Um, and the aims of Bitcoin Optech are to help Bitcoin companies adopt scaling technologies, things like SegWit, transaction batching, um, coin selection, fee estimation, that kind of thing. And I contribute to Bitcoin Core. Um, so usually I give a bit more color and background on all of those things, all of those projects. Um, but we're filming this, and I'm sure the guys at home just want to get straight to the main course. So uh, let's get on with it. And if we have time at the end, I can talk about some of these projects. All right, so what am I going to talk about? Um, Bitcoin Core 0 0.17, which is currently going through its release, final release preparation. I'll talk about the release schedule. I'll give you some fun facts and figures about the release, and then highlight some interesting PRs. And if you have any questions, please just interrupt, shout. All right, so Bitcoin Core is the reference, what's called the reference implementation of Bitcoin. Um, you'll see here that Bitcoin Core does not equal Bitcoin. Um, it's an implementation, and it is the most widely run implementation. When I say that, it's probably 99% of nodes on the network run Bitcoin Core. And Bitcoin does not have a, a uh, detailed specification. It doesn't have a prescribed spec that you can write an implementation from. Really, the best we could do is describe the system as it is. And the best description of the system as it is, is the source code of Bitcoin Core, because that's what people run. Um, Bitcoin Core is a continuation of Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamoto's original client, which was released in January 2009. And you can see the repo is hosted on GitHub at Bitcoin slash Bitcoin. And the project page is bitcoincore.org, where you can download binaries. Everyone happy with that? All kind of makes sense. The Bitcoin Core lifecycle, we have a major release every six or seven months. Um, so the last one was G16 or 0 0.16 in February. Um, that was about six months ago. And we have minor releases for bug fixes when necessary. The most recent was 16.2. And if you want more information about that, you can go to bitcoincore.org and look at the lifecycle page. So on to 17, um, there's always a, a GitHub issue for a release. Sorry, the writing's a bit small. Um, but if you go to PR12624, you'll see the timeline for the release. And we're about here. So back on July 2nd, there's a whole load of translation work for strings. So Strings can get translated into local languages. There's a feature freeze, after which we don't have any more feature PRs. We have bug fix PRs that go in. And then the branch happened on Monday, and we start the release candidate cycle. People start testing it. We go through the deterministic builds, the Gitty and stuff. And we aim for a release on September the 8th. OK, everyone happy with that so far? Just on the reference implementation, so I mean, those are words. Like, how would you define the reference implementation? Is it the implementation that's most widely used? Yeah. Um, well, like I said, you, we couldn't have, we can't prescribe a spec for Bitcoin because it's a decentralized system. Um, we can describe the activity we see in the network, that what people are running, and most people run Bitcoin Core. So, de facto, if not de jure, it is the specification for Bitcoin, and... Um, so if more, than, if more than 50% of nodes, say, 
what BTC did tomorrow, then BTC will become the reference implementation. Arguably, or well, that's a very civil attackable metric. <laughs> but if if the majority of the economic if the economic majority decides to run BTCD, may, maybe that would be arguably the reference implementation. Are you not, uh, sorry to keep... Oh, no, 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 please, please, question. please. Are you not of the same opinion people like Peter Toll who say that you, know, you can't actually have a written spec, it doesn't actually work for this kind of system, and so effectively Bitcoin Core is the, is the definition of Bitcoin as a piece of software? Um, I'm, I'm sympathetic because... Um, you, you can't tell people what the spec of Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is what people are running, right? That if people choose to run Bitcoin Core, then that's Bitcoin for them. And if everyone is running Bitcoin Core, then that's the best possible description of the system, the best possible description because it includes all of the bugs and all of the behavior you would see on the network. Can I ask maybe a more specific question? Do you think it's dangerous for people to run alternative It's dangerous. I, I philosophically, I would like that to. I would like people to have alternative implementations because it seems like a better way for decentralization. But um, Satoshi and Peter Todd are in agreement here that an alternative implementation is a menace to the system. Um, if you want to stay in consensus with Bitcoin Core, you need to replicate all of, all of Bitcoin Core's behaviors, bugs and all. Um, and it's very difficult to do that. Human brains are not very good at thinking out all of the edge cases. The neutrino is a alternative implementation. Neutrino. Neutrino is an alternative implementation. Or arts. Neutrino is a new light client mode that was proposed by Laolu and, and various others. Um, it's, a, it's a protocol in itself, really. And it was implemented, I believe, in BTCD, and it's being implemented on Bitcoin Core. Um, Neutrino is not a consensus protocol. It's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol between a full node and a, a light node. I should probably let you do the presentation. No, this is, fine. Right this is fine. You don't run any other. Uh, Personally, I, I do not know. Okay, so that's that's how far we've got. All right, facts and figures. Here's a warning for you: don't count commits. They're they're a really lousy metric, both for individual contributions to a project and also overall development velocity for a project. Um, for a couple of reasons: one, they're not fungible. Like I could open a PR that has 20 commits that is refactoring. And Suhas could open a PR that's one commit that is fixing a critical DOS vulnerability. Which one's more important? The second one. But mine has 20 more commits than his, or 19 more. Um, and secondly, it's looking at the wrong thing. We're not really constrained on people writing code. Like any, any fool can write code. We're more bottlenecked on good testing and good reviewing and really deep understanding of the system to be able to do that good reviewing. So. Um, Count commits at your warning. So with that disclosure, I'm going to count some commits. Um, so let's, let's have a look. I, I took um, the Git repository, or the Git repo from when 16 was branched to when 17 was branched, 195 calendar days, um, 1,225, sorry, 1,225 non-merge commits. That's six commits a day, 748 PRs. Again, PRs are not fungible. so. Numbers don't really matter very much, but that's 3.8 PRs being merged every single day, which seems pretty fast to me. Um, 135 unique commit authors. Now, I'm going to use a heuristic that one author equals one person here. It's, you, know, you, you could have more than one GitHub user and be committing, or maybe two people could be sharing one GitHub login. I don't know. But let's, let's use this as a, a pretty close heuristic. 67 new committers, which is pretty good for a project. That's like every three days, we get a new committer to Bitcoin Core. Um, and again, lines of code, another terrible metric, but um, 560 lines of code get changed every day. That seems pretty fast to me. Um, if people tell you that Bitcoin Core is slow moving, then I would disagree with them. Uh, what else do I want to say about this? 
No, I think that's it. Any questions about any of those things? Maybe it's too much. Maybe it's too fast. Maybe, there are too many changes. Maybe it's. Sure, I like the idea that there's 568 lines changing every day. Yeah, so, okay, also, yes, I, I should just add another disclaimer. Um, I ran all these scripts. I haven't had other people check my, <laughs> check my workings. Uh, things like this, I guess, maybe file renames count. So, um, yeah. And refactors, you know, large scale refactors will change a lot of lines. Um, but I'll, I'll try and post all of the commands I ran. So if you want to audit those numbers, you can do that. Other interesting figures from the GitHub API um, review comments. So we had 9,553 PR review comments. That's 50 comments per day and 182 unique commenters. I think that's, a, that's probably a, a better measure of the activity in this project. Um, Marco Falca, he's a maintainer. He's, he cheats because he's got a bot that will tell you, that will comment and tell you that your PR needs rebasing. So he's, he wins, but fine. Um, Vladimir is another maintainer. Promag and Practical Swift do a lot of reviewing. Cipher is Peter Wooler, obviously very active. Um, so I'd say that's, that's pretty good. And to give you some context over the previous three releases, um, in parentheses are uh, per day, so commits per day fairly, fairly steady, between five and a half and seven. PRs merged, three, three to four PRs per day. Uh, new authors, so every single release we've had an increasing number of new authors, which is, I think, pretty good as a health metric for the project. Um, if people tell you that Bitcoin Core is centralized, then you can just tell them how many authors we actually have. Um, and again, lots of comments and comments increasing. So even though Marco has maybe 500 or 1,000 bots comments, we still have a lot of commenting and reviewing. Um, and then one more metric for you, the, the Blockstream Core FUD index. Um, <laughs> this is a fraction of commits by Blockstream employees and interns. Not many. If they're trying to co-opt the Bitcoin Core open source project, they're doing a lousy job, I have to say. Um, most of these commits are from Peter Wooler, and then of the remaining ones, most are from Andrew Chow. So, yeah, they're, they're really not pulling their weight. Any questions about any of those numbers? No comments. Um, it's generally yep. not. I would expect it to be noisier, like more people who don't really know what's going on commenting. Like, how, how do you ensure that most of the comments are really high quality or from people that really understand what the PR is trying to achieve? Um, well, it's a completely open system, so commenting and opening PRs is open to everyone. Generally, you, you get some trolls, but not that many. Most people are actually trying to help, and you, you might disagree with what they're saying, or you might find that they're adding nits and saying you should use an underscore here instead of there. But on the whole, they're pretty, they're pretty good, I'd say. There's no ability to like mute. Like on Twitter. Uh, if, there's, if someone's trolling, they can be banned from the project. And if a, an individual PR is attracting a lot of brigading, it can be locked. But it doesn't happen very much. A lot of the, uh, what you're saying there seems to be sort of counteracting a narrative of it's a sort of stagnant project and so on. What, yeah. what, do you think, where do you think that comes from? Because I've heard it as well. I find it really strange. But I, I, I don't know. Um, there's, there's a lot of strange narratives in Bitcoin, but I think the numbers really speak for themselves. And if you... Well, the numbers speak for themselves, but perhaps people might say, you know, people who, let's say, they're in theory, people might, yeah. they might want to actually quantitatively compare. I mean, yeah. Is it, I think it is more than Ethereum, isn't it? Although I don't have data. Um, well, if you take what I said about commits being a terrible metric, right. then you can... Right. <laughs> you can... Uh, say comparing commits is an even worse thing to do. True. Um, now all of this is changes to an implementation of Bitcoin. None of this, there were, there were no protocol changes in any of these versions. So um, Bitcoin the protocol moves pretty slowly or pretty fast depending on what your viewpoint of how fast things should move up. Um, but Bitcoin core, the implementation as you can see is, is very active.
John, how do you think a little bit uh, about the like, choppiness of PR? So, some, I mean, there's PRs that are open for months at a time and yeah. lots of comments and certainly getting the attention it deserves. And then there's, um, you know, in software, what you're looking for is sort of like a smoothness and predictability. And you're seeing these metrics on the whole sort of point, I guess, in, the, in positive directions. But yeah. how do you sort of think about the the, the nature of the, the um, inertia of large PRs, or when to move on, when to, when to focus. Are you talking about um, individual PRs where people struggle to get review and attention? Or? I don't think it's reviewed. I think it's the idea that um, there are um, Again, in sort of building a software team, you're looking for even flow and predictable okay. flow. And right. it's sort of like, um, I mean, that's, it is a measure of velocity. Yep. Um, with, with something like this that has so many different constituents and so many different interests, how do you think about sort of the, um, again, PRs that are open for a really long time or, um, Again, there's, there's, there's code inertia there. If you, if you leave something over for months at a time, yep. new things come along, things get stale, people get angry. Yeah. Um, well, first I'd argue it's not a team. Bitcoin Core is, is an open source process where we have maintainers who click the button to merge, but they're not directing resource or allocating resource. Um, so it's, it's different from a, a proprietary project and it is open source or decentralized in the extreme. It's much more decentralized than a system like Linux where there's a, a benevolent dictator. Um, like the bigger picture, you can see it's kind of, it's, it smooths itself out in terms of PRs and, and commits and there is activity and it's, I would argue, fairly rapid. For an individual PR, um, it's, it's an open source project and it's if you want something merged it's your responsibility to write the code and entice people to review it and once it has acceptance from a large enough number of people then it might get merged but um, you know, some people can't do that or won't do that um, other people are more successful at it it's I think it's the nature of the of the open sourceness and the decentralization of the project does that answer your question? Yeah, it's a tough question because it, yeah. it is very different than running a, you know, a team where it has a boss and things like that. But yeah. Just one interesting thing. Uh, I have a question about PRs that are consensus sensitive. Is there any special handling of those? Yeah. Do you, do, do you guys trust the continuous integration only, or are there PRs that needs to take longer to bring them into testing an environment? I think that's, yeah, I, certainly anything that touches consensus code receives a lot more attention and a lot more review and the bar for review is higher. So we have four maintainers, uh, Vladimir, Marco, Peter and Jonas, and they're the ones who, who push the button. Um, they will, I, I suppose they will look at how critical that PR is and if it touches consensus and their bar for merging will be higher for something that requires consensus. Um, people are very, 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 very careful about consensus critical code, and rightly so. Um, I've had PRs rejected that... But it's only, only it's based on a review, or is there any extra testing that will test more thoroughly? Um, well, individual reviewers will test more thoroughly, probably. Um, we have a, an integration test suite that runs against every PR an extended test suite that runs every night on master. Um, so I would say the integration testing is pretty good. Um, and it's got better over the last two years. Unit testing could improve. We could get better test coverage. But um, it's, it's mainly down to individual reviewers and maintainers' sensitivity to knowing, experience, wisdom, knowing that this PR needs more attention. So has there ever been kind of an attempt, or I don't know, to like 
formally identified which parts of the code are consensus critical, or is it just kind of something you, you knowledge you need to build up by? Okay. It would be nice if there was a lib consensus and it was separated, but we're not there yet. That's that's an eventual aim, and I don't know if you guys were around back in 2013, 14, when um, the database backing the the blockchain database changed from Berkeley DB to Level DB, and that was an incompatible change. Yeah. That was consensus, but it it wasn't like consensus code. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, people. There's wisdom and and built up experience. Any other questions on kind of the big picture? All right, let's have a look at some interesting PRs. So I don't know if it's just me because I spend a lot of time looking at the wallet, but I think there are a lot of interesting wallet changes, and I'll talk about all of these PRs. Um, I won't read them out to you because that's kind of boring, and then a few other PRs. A few other changes in different parts of the code base, um, and again, I'm not sure if it's just because I spend more time looking at the wallet that I that I selected these ones as interesting. Um, but I, I think these are the interesting ones. Yep, yep. Okay. Um, so first one I'm going to talk about is watch-only wallets. Um, that is, I don't have the PR number here, but it's in the first slide, and our wallet for a long time has had the concept of watch-only keys, watch-only addresses where um, you, you say I'm interested in this address or this key and you don't have the private key so you can't sign transactions, you can't send money away from it, but you're watching and you're including that in your balance. Um, Jonas had a, a PR that adds an option to create a new wallet that only allows watch-only. So you've got your, your addresses on your Bitcoin Core instance but your private keys might be in a hardware wallet. So this is, this is really nice. It's better for, for some use cases. For some people, that's a better security model. You don't need to keep your keys on a device that's connected to the network. You keep them on your hardware wallet, and um, you just use your node to watch for transactions that are involving your keys. We don't have full hardware wallet integration support yet, but this is a good step towards that. All right. Um, next up is a new coin selection algorithm. Um, so Bitcoin is a UTXO system. That means you don't, ha you don't have an account in Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't know about accounts. You hold a, a collection of coins, UTXOs. So you might have a, a 10 Bitcoin UTXO and a 5 Bitcoin UTXO and a 2 Bitcoin UTXO. And you know about all of those, so you know that you have a balance of 17, but there's no, there's no concept of accounts in Bitcoin. Um, and when you go to spend, if you want to spend eight Bitcoin out of your collection of coins, you need to choose which coins as your inputs to that transaction. That's called coin selection. It's every wallet that needs to spend or needs to send Bitcoin needs to, needs to do coin selection in some way. Bitcoin Core used to have a really bad way of doing coin selection. We now have a much better way called branch and bound based on Mark Eckhart's master's thesis. Um, and it does two things which improve the behavior for the Bitcoin Core wallet. First, it uses the effective value of UTXOs instead of their, their face value, if you like. So if I have a five Bitcoin UTXO and I want to spend it, because that, because that input into the transaction takes up space, I need to attach fee to it. And it costs money to add a new input. So it's not really worth five Bitcoin because I need to add fee just to use it. It's worth 4.999, for example. So we use the effective value now instead of the actual value. That, that makes it a much simpler knapsack problem because you're, the things you're putting in the knapsack aren't changing size as you go. And we have an efficient search for exact matches. So we try and avoid having a change output. Um, a change output adds one, one more UTXO to your wallet. It comes back and then you need to spend it in future. So if you can avoid, if you can create a transaction that avoids change, that will reduce your fees. So that's gone in. So does it use like a, some kind of dust limit to decide what counts as an exact match on kind of tolerance? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm just wondering like how, how, how often would you find an exact match in, in every day? Quite often. Match? Yeah. Really? Quite often. Um, I think Mark said 20% in his data set. Which percent? 20. 20? If you, but he was using a large wallet. If you're, if you're an, uh, an institution, if you're a Coinbase, right. then almost because you have so many UTXOs, 
almost all the time you'll be able to, be able to avoid change. If it's you or me and we have five coins or 10 coins, obviously not so much. Um, next up, this is something that I worked on. Um, in 0 0.16, we added the, the ability to have multiple wallets running from a single node. And that's really nice if, you're, if you have some kind of service and you have clients and you're running wallets on their behalf, or if you have a personal wallet and a business wallet, or whatever reason, um, you can completely segregate those wallets and have them running off the same full node. Prior to this release, you'd need to specify all of those wallets at startup. So it's a command line option saying, I want to start with wallet one, wallet two, wallet three. This just means that you can start up your node and then you can load new wallets or create new wallets on the fly, unload them. It's just a bit nicer. Um, next up is a new RPC called scan TX out set. Um, so when you, when you start Bitcoin for the first time and you have a wallet with keys in it, or if you import a new wallet into Bitcoin, Bitcoin Core, um, you want to check the UTXO set, you want to check what coins you own. Right? Your, your, your wallet might contain some addresses or some keys, but you don't know if any of those keys are associated with UTXOs. So when we, when we load a new wallet in Bitcoin Core, we scan the entire blockchain from the start. And that can, take, that can take some time. So if you're impatient, you might not want to do that every time you import a new address or import a new key. This scan TX out set allows you to specify um, a key or an address or a script and say, instead of scanning from the start of time up to now, just look at the set of UTXOs, look at the set of unspent coins that are still in existence now and find those that match with my script or my address. Um, that then outputs an array and you can then either sign or do whatever you want with that array. Um, can I ask about that? Because that seems like such a huge win. I, I always wondered why, why we had this kind of rescanning requirement when we imported it. Was it. Is it just that we got around to it, or is there some trade-off in doing it this way? Or, um, yeah, no one got around to it. They, I mean, you lose, you lose your history, right? So you lose your deposits and withdrawals, if you like. Oh, so you just end up, now. it's only what you've got now. Right, of course, yeah, that's, yes. That's um, but you could have a hybrid mode where you do this initially so you know what your balance is and then you backfill. Uh, yeah. Okay, so an aside on output descriptors. Um, this is something new. This is kind of a, a shift in the way that we think about wallets and we think about keys and addresses in wallets. This was proposed by Peter Wooler in the last three to six months. Um, and the problem he's trying to solve is if I'm trying to import a new key into my wallet, I might have a private key and I import it, that private key doesn't contain any information about the type of script that I'm listening for transactions on. Right? So a private key will map to a public key, and then you can use that public key to create a pay to pub key, or you can use it to create a pay to pub key hash, or you can use it to create a pay to witness script hash, or witness pub key hash, or witness public key hash wrapped within a P2SH. Um, so if I just give you a key, or if you just give me a key, I will need to construct all of those different scripts and then scan the blockchain for every single one. It's inefficient, um, it's not very flexible. So output descriptors are a, a new language for describing um, pub keys and private keys that I'm interested in. And um, a scan TX outset uses output descriptors. It's the first RPC that uses that new model of, sorry, um, thinking about keys and addresses. Um, in future, other RPCs will be updated to use this method. And the, whole, the hope is the whole wallet will be refactored around this idea of descriptors for outputs rather than keys and then ad hoc try and determine the, the scripts for those keys. Um, this is a gist from Peter Willer, so I can send out the slides and if you're interested in reading up on what that language is. Next up is multi-wallet for the GUI. Like I said, in 16 we had multi-wallet, but it was only accessible through RPCs. It's now accessible through the GUI, so people who are using just to 
the, the Qt GUI can access multiple wallets or send from multiple wallets. Uh, this is another PR that steps towards that, that new design, the output descriptor um, design for the wallet. It introduces an interface between the key store and the signing logic. Um, so that's, it's a small step, but it's in the right direction. And I expect in 18 or v 0.19, we will move more in that direction of the output descriptor based wallet, and it will be quite a large refactor. Uh, next up, the accounts API. Does anyone has anyone ever used accounts? Do you know what accounts are? Adam's used accounts. Oh. <laughs> RIP accounts. Um, accounts was kind of a bolt-on system to the wallet. Um, like I said, Bitcoin itself, the the network, the protocol has no concept of accounts. This this feature of accounts was bolted on some years ago, and it's got all kinds of deficiencies. Um, it doesn't scale. You can end up with negative balances if you have conflicting transactions, all kinds of stuff. Um, and the thinking is accounting should be done outside of Bitcoin Core. So you have the wallet that deals with UTXOs, and then any kind of higher level logic can live outside of that, and you can, you can have accounts outside of Bitcoin Core. We retained the ability to attach labels to addresses, so you can label an address, but there's no, no longer any concept of those labels having, an, having a balance. So um, RIP accounts, they've been deprecated and will be removed fully in 0 0.18. Next up, uh, sorry, was there a question? No. Uh, next up is a bit called partially signed Bitcoin transactions, this is bit 174. Um, this was um, spec'd out by Andrew Chow and implemented in Bitcoin Core by Andrew Chow. This is a way to pass around a transaction that is not complete. We have a, a, um, a format for a transaction that is complete. It's the format that transactions look like on Bitcoin. But until now, there was, no, um, there was no format for a transaction that maybe had one signature but was waiting for a, a co-signer to sign the second part of it. There's no way to specify that, OK, I signed this bit. I need you to sign this bit. Um, PBST is that format and it would allow me, for example, if I had a Bitcoin Core instance and a Trezor wallet and I had one key on my Bitcoin Core wallet and one key on my hardware wallet, I could sign it with my Bitcoin Core wallet and then pass off the partially signed transaction and then have the other, the hardware wallet, sign the transaction and then submit it to the network. So this is a nice interop thing between having some keys on Bitcoin Core and having some keys on a different wallet. Um, it, it should be really good if the, if the other wallets adopt this standard. And Bitcoin Core has now adopted it. It's added a bunch of new RPCs like create, partially signed Bitcoin transaction, decode, PBST, finalize PBST. Um, so that's now there. A question from Twitter. Yep. Uh, Crypt Chameleon said, is this only going to be available through RPCs or will there be a GUI in the core? Uh, in 0 0.17, just RPCs. Um, and that's normally the way things go, that if there's a new feature, it's initially RPC only, and then it might eventually end up in the, in the GUI. But PRs are welcome. So. Yeah. Here's a nice one, small, small PR. Um, and to understand this, we've got to get into um, signatures and signature encoding. Um, Satoshi, when he created Bitcoin, decided that signatures ECDSA signatures in Bitcoin would be DER encoded. Um, that's an encoding for signatures. It's pretty inefficient. It doesn't need to be that inefficient. Um, there's a bunch of bytes that are not required. And um, interestingly, there are two values in the signature, R and S. And depending whether they're low or high, they could be 32 bytes or 33 bytes, or even if they're really low, they could be less than 32 bytes. Now, S in the signature must always be low. That's a standard miss rule. Um, it's not a consensus rule, so you could have high S in a block. But if, you're, if you create a transaction with high S, the other nodes on the network will not uh, propagate it around. So S is always small. Um, R could be high, in which case you'd have a 33-byte um, section for R. Or it could be low, in which case it's 32 bytes. 
Um, but R is a random nonce, so if you get an R that ends up being 33 bytes, you can just pick another R, which is 32 bytes, and so your signature, instead of being 72 bytes, is 71 bytes, or maybe even lower. Um, that's nice. So you save half a byte on every signature, or just over half a byte on average. Um, fine, doesn't sound like much, but that's a few, more th few thousand transactions a day if everyone does this. Um, so anyone who's using Bitcoin Core benefits because they have smaller transactions and pay lower fees. Anyone who's not using Bitcoin Core also benefits because they have more space to put their transactions in the blockchain. So, little wins, small wins. There, there, there are all counter arguments against this, right? Like, for, first of all, we have to you have to screw around with the RFC six nine seven nine nonce generation, which is a standard that everyone's picked up for, for security. But you have to add in some extra data. You, you do nearly lose, like I think it's like one bit of entropy. Right? So, that's uh, correct. Massive amount of yes. bytes. Um, so I mean, and also somebody made another comment that we could consider as negative. Well, this is a, I think this is a stretch. Is it, it's like the watermarks cause a wallet. Um, that is a stretch. I would say. A stretch. I agree. Yeah. Um, I, I do. I do honestly wonder whether, whether there was any point in doing this. It just seems like, for, like, like I say, for half a byte on average. Yeah. In a transaction on average of 250 bytes. Yep. It's a <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very small win. Yeah. Um, and it all goes back to the encoding, right? Yeah. There's really only 64 bytes that are actually important in the signature. We just have some fluff around it because that's the encoding that Satoshi used. And he used it because of open SSL, right? And that's where it yeah. came from. So. Correct. Um, when we, if we get Schnorr signatures, which hopefully we will, um, we're free to choose our own encoding. And in fact, Peter Wooler has proposed a BIP, the encoding of Schnorr signatures, which is 64 bytes, because that's all it needs to be. So this kind of argument that if, if assuming there's a high, high moderate probability of that happening, then this is kind of a bit of a waste of time assuming that happens. It's, so not only, not only is it a small win, but it's also a small win that you surrender assuming. Right, Schnorr signatures will not replace ECDSA. Like, ECDSA will still be valid, and all of the UTXOs in existence are using ECDSA, so they still need to be spent. And even after Schnorr gets um, implemented and um, activated in, on the Bitcoin network, people will still be using EC, ECDSA. SegWit has been active for just over a year, and about 40%, I think, of transactions have SegWit inputs. So there's still some way to go with EC ECDSA, and it's not a big change, right? You, you create your signature, and if your R is small, you just increment it by one. Sorry, if your R is large, you just increment it by one and try again. R is a random nonce you put into your signature. So it's a pretty easy change, and you win a byte. Here's another um, efficiency gain. This is um, to do with when we hash 64-byte inputs, which we do a lot in Bitcoin. Um, if you'll recall, the way that we commit to the transactions in the block is by placing the root of a Merkle tree in the block header. And a Merkle tree is created by hashing all the transactions and then pairwise hashing the digests, and when you when you hash together two digests, you have a 32-byte output from the first one and a 32-output byte from the second one. You have 64 bytes, you hash them together. Um, we had a generic hashing algorithm, and Peter Wooler implemented this much more efficient algorithm using um, you know, these different instruction sets, SSE, SSE4, AVX2. And so if you, if you hash a Merkle root, with 9,001 leaves. That takes 7.2 milliseconds with the previous algorithm. Um, with AVX 8.2 and 8-way, so if you're doing eight of these hashes in parallel, you, you get some wins there as well. That takes it down, so that's about a 6x win. Um, even, even without AVX and SSE 4, um, even one way, you, you get a bit of a win. You get a 30% win. 
doesn't sound, we're talking about milliseconds here, so that doesn't sound very much, but in fact, we do this a lot. Oops, uh, we do this a lot. We do this hashing a lot, and in fact, it's the, it's the main delay between receiving a block and propagating it on, because you receive the block, you get all the transactions, and then you verify that they actually hash down to the commitment in the block header, and until you've done that, you can't pass it on. So this is kind of in the critical path for block propagation, so these are nice wins. Any questions about that? And so this was, this was the first PR. There are were, there were several others that use different instruction sets and, and um, all around the same, the same theme. That's not a wallet PR. I've, oh yeah, okay, I've, I've, I've finished the wallet PRs. We're on to other, this is more of a, like a consensus, I guess. Because if this is wrong, then consensus is broken. Um, but this is a node PR. Uh, next up is separating the GUI from the wallet and the node. This was a refactor, so normally I wouldn't talk about refactors because it's all under the hood and maybe not very interesting for users. But this is nice because it modularizes the code base a bit. Um, until now, it's been a bit of a blob and different components call into other components all over the place, especially the wallet is like calling in in various places. This is nice because it it implements an interface between the, the, the um, QT, the GUI code, and the node and the wallet code. So there's a bit more separation there. That's good for just good hygiene, right? It's, it's better to have modularization. It's good for testing because you can mock up different components. And it's nice because eventually we would be able to, starting with this work, separate the processes that the GUI is running on from the, the what the process that the node is running on. And eventually, we'll do the same with the wallet, hopefully, and that will be running on different processes. And that's really nice because that means your private keys are no longer in the same process memory space as your node, which is connecting out onto the network. So it's good for security. Um, it's, it's just moving, moving the software in the right direction. It's also good for, from, a, from a software project standpoint because Doing this kind of separation means perhaps in the future we'll be able to separate out those different components as different projects and have be able to work on them in parallel rather than having just this one huge project. Question. Uh, yes. There's a whole Python test suite code basically. Does it replicate code in order to test? Does it replicate? I'm sorry, does it duplicate code in order to test? Or so the, the Python, the, the integra integration test or functional test suite, um, it uses the RPC interface and it uses the peer-to-peer -peer interface. So at the moment it treats the entire, entire node plus wallet as a single unit. Um, the GUI, we, we don't test with that, that functional test suite. But if we separated out the wallet and we had a well-defined interface there, you could separately test the wallet by mocking up a node and, and poking it over that interface. And, and likewise, um, you could test the, that interface by um, separately having a, a, a test suite attached to that interface. And this is my final PR. Um, it's not my PR, it's Jim Posen's PR. It is building the TX index in parallel with validation. So the TX index is an additional index in the database. Um, prior to this, it was the same database that mapped the, um, the transaction ID to the block and the position in the block, or more precisely, the transaction ID to the block file and the position in that file. Um, and that's nice because if you want to look up a, t a transaction, you can use a TX index and see exactly where it is in, in your block files, and then you can, you can find it. Um, if you don't have TX index on, then once a transaction output is spent, there's no way to find it. Uh, so uh, some people run with TX index. Jimpo, uh, Jim Posen has separated out that TX index from the rest of the database, so it's now its, its own database. That's nice. He's also changed the code so it's built on a separate thread. It's built in parallel with validation. So there's, it, it never blocks the, the main validation thread. So it, during IBD, initial block download, 
when you first turn it on, on your node and it's downloading all of the blocks and, and bringing you up to the tip, TX index would, would block that and slow it down. Now that IBD can go all the way to the tip and TX index in the background can just fill in, fill in the index. Um, now why is he doing this? Um, it's because he is one of the co-implementers of Neutrino that you were talking about earlier. And Neutrino adds an additional index for every block. It creates this new filter uh, which you match on. So he's gone about this by creating this kind of modular design where you can have any number of indexes running on separate threads going over the history of the blocks. At the moment, we have the TX index, but he'll also add the neutrino index. It's, it's not called neutrino anymore, I don't think, but um, the, the light client index, and that can run on another thread and create that index as well. And then eventually, we'll be able to serve that up to light clients. So that's nice. Um, Jim puts on a lot of work there, and it's, it's all really good stuff. All right, those are all the PRs I had. Um, that was not quite as long. As oh, thank you. Um, so, any questions on any of that? Any PR related to mining? Pardon? Any PR related to mining? Any PR related to mining? Um, there were some mempool cleanups. I don't know if that would have any impact on transaction selection in mining. Nothing specific. The, the SHA optimization you said helps specifically in terms of block uh, propagation. Like, yeah. Block yeah, so block propagation is really important. Transaction propagation is less important because if you send out a transaction, your expectation is there won't be a block for another 10 minutes. So whether that transaction takes 10 seconds to reach the entire network or 100 seconds, it's not that big a deal. Block propagation really is very important because every second that a block, every additional second that a block takes to propagate from the miner who discovered it to the other miners is time that those miners are doing useless work, right? All the, all the work that you do not on the tip is wasted and it leads to a higher um, stale block rate because sometimes those miners who are not on the tip will discover a block which will be at the same height. So the faster block propagation is, hi John, um, the better in terms of lowering that stale block rate. Any other questions? With, uh, with the ability to run uh, multiple wallets and the ability to run a watch every wallet, yep. you know what you can run the two, run a, a watching online and yeah, exactly. Um, the, I can't remember the name of the option, disable private keys. Um, that is an option per wallet. So you can, you can create a new wallet that has disabled private keys and run it at the same time as a wallet that is a hot wallet. Um, and that will, that will persist over stop starts. So that's a, that's a property of the, the individual wallet file. Yep. How does the, um Wallet reloading work. So, in in a general sense, is it like do you is it um, signals? Is it uh, RPC calls? Or what, what is the? Uh, There's an internal interface where every time a block comes in, it goes through validation, and that validation interface, um, the wallet subscribes to that to events, and the um, the node will push. It will say, "I've got a new block with all of these transactions." send them all to the wallet, and the wallet will look through every single transaction and say, is this mine? Is this output interesting to me? Oh, sorry. So you, you said that you can basically um, swap out the wallets for running node without restarting? Yep. So do you, what's, what's the interface for that? Like, how do I do that as a user? Yeah. Uh, that, that's RPC okay. at the moment. Um, there's an RPC called load wallet, mm -hmm. unload wallet, okay. create wallet. Um, it will be in the GUI eventually. There will be like a menu item, but that didn't make it in in time. So I've got a bunch of questions. Okay. Uh, so at any point, someone jump in with your questions. So we'll, so we'll start right from the beginning. So <laughs> the beginning of John Newbury, um, before Bitcoin Core, like what did you work on? 
um, and like what expertise did you build prior to the technology? Um, we could do this. I, I could talk about the other projects. I, I, if anyone's interested in Q and A on Bitcoin Core zero point seventeen, I can do that now, and then we can go on to other yeah, stuff. Some Bitcoin Core questions. Okay, let's let's do. <laughs> I, I'm sh I don't know whether people at home are interested in okay. the, the John Newbury story. Um, so Bitcoin Core now, or Bitcoin Core from. Beginning with Bitcoin Core to today. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, like, so you started getting involved with Bitcoin Core by writing tests and rebuilding the test framework. Yeah. Like, what's your what are your thoughts on the state of tests today in comparison to the state of tests when you started contributing? Uh, much much better. <laughs> um, the I think the integration test suite, functional test suite, is really nice. Um, I spend a lot of time on it, and I think it's good because it's very easy to write tests. It's almost too easy to write tests with the functional test suite, um, and people will often write tests with the functional test suite when a unit test will be more appropriate um, because it's just nice and easy to write a Python test. Um, so the functional test suite takes a, a running Bitcoin Core, it, it, it fires up an instance of Bitcoin Core or multiple instances and then pokes it in various ways over the RPC and peer-to-peer and -peer interface and asserts on various aspects of the behavior of those nodes. That's quite a, a large sledgehammer if you're just making an internal change to a, a small piece of behavior. So we are guilty, I would say, of overusing the functional test suite and it would be better if the unit tests were, um, had better coverage and were, were more used. But I, I think we have decent testing, um, especially compared to certain other projects um, in the space. I think I think it's pretty good. Um, yeah. Can I ask about the um, not on that topic? Uh, you said somewhere in the talk that there's another, there's like an integration test, but there's some extra test. Or you run you run one today. What's the name of it? What's that? The extended. Extended. Yeah. Extended test suite. So. Um, it's just more more tests and the tests that take a long time to run. Mm -hmm. So we have a test for pruning um, where you need to build up a blockchain of several gigabytes and it takes half an hour to run. Um, so that our, our basic suite is run every time someone opens a PR or every time something is merged into master. We have continuous integration um, and just to make sure that doesn't take like an hour every time um, some of those tests are just put into an extended test run. What's the bottom line? Is it I.O.? For pruning. For example, for the extended one. Is it, is it varies for different ones? It varies. Um, there's one that um, kind of corrupts the database and makes sure that we recover from that corruption and does it many, many times. Oh. Um, they could probably be made to run quicker. What does it run? Where does it run? Yeah. Uh, we use Travis for our CI, but you can run them yourself. It's pretty easy to run them. Yeah. Just wondering if I can split it up. I'm guessing Travis is not the fastest. Travis is not the fastest, no. And Travis catches a lot, lots of interesting bugs in the test suite because when you run them on your own machine, they run at a speed that you expect, and then you, they run in Travis, and something's running slowly, and something's running fast, and you hit these window conditions. Um, so that's really good for finding bugs in the testing. I, I don't know who finds bugs in the actual product. So I, I, was, I, I watched the uh, Greg Max talk about Bitcoin Core Zero in San Francisco. He was saying that you, the culture of Bitcoin Core is that you insert bugs at every opportunity, every line. Um, and then verify the tests have failed due to that bug. Okay. Is that common common behavior, or like do other altcoins have a similar culture with the rest of them? Is it <laughs> specific to Bitcoin Core? Um, I don't know about other altcoins, and I mean that's a very Greg specific comment. I would say he he's very thorough with his testing. Not sure if every contributor is equally thorough, but it's good practice. You know the. I think 
I think he said the test tests the code and the code tests the tests. Um, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's always good practice to break your tests and make sure that they actually break because it's very easy to get into a give yourself a false sense of security if your tests are not actually testing what they're supposed to be testing. But perhaps you wouldn't be a startup. <laughs> Greg is renowned for um, his review and his testing. Certainly. There's yeah. also the issue of what he mostly would, I think, nowadays, things that they say about the server, the loop set, the loop set, the loop set, the test suites there, they're just, they're just beyond all. They're, 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 they're on a different level because it's, yeah. I suppose, logically, because the security implications of failure there are so catastrophic. So, you know, the famous example is they, their, their tests were so thorough that they found a test in another project in openness itself because they found out a particular kind of ECDSA target on them. But I'm just, I'm just saying perhaps that's partly a slight difference. Probably you can't be like that with the whole of the web. It would slow things down, possibly. Um, yeah, I think test coverage in Libstep P is 99 point something percent. It's very, very high. So on Schnorr, uh, if you had to do the devil advocate's argument that Schnorr shouldn't be implemented, is, mm. is there an argument? What is that argument? No. <laughs> there's no, I don't think there's any particular argument against Schnorr. You might be against protocol changes in general and say we, we should revert to Satoshi's original vision. Um, but Schnorr is just better in every way. It's, it's how digital signatures should be done, and ECDSA is a, a legal hack to get around um, Schnorr's patent on, on the Schnorr algorithm. So I was talking about encoding. You know, we, we get a better encoding for free. I mean, we, we, could, we could change ECDSA, or we could add a new encoding for ECDSA. Um, so that's not inherent to Schnorr. But we get smaller signatures, we get linearity, which means we can do nice things with multi-sig and threshold signatures. It means we can do scriptless scripts, taproot, um, just so much cool stuff. There's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, <laughs> I can't tell you there's an argument that can sit. My two-hour talk from this uh, meetup a couple of months ago, in which I, but um, yeah, anyone watching on YouTube, I think there's some, uh, it's, it's on YouTube. Yep. I think people don't, I think it's a point that wasn't completely clear in the bit that, that, that Peter would have wrote, which is great, but he's like, the security um, of Schnorr is like strictly at least as good as the PCDSA. So yes. anyone, like there, there might be other ones, but if anyone tries to argue that Schnorr shouldn't be implemented because of security, it's, it doesn't, it's logically possible that, yep. that, that, that it's less secure than So uh, Segwit was kind of like a bundled software, right? Um, lots of changes bundled into one. Do you have any view in terms of whether changes should be made like one by one, or whether you support this bundling features into one particular bit? Um, there wasn't, I don't think there was much bundled in Segwit. It was all part of the same um, transaction format. So it made sense to just do it, you know, do it properly. So it, there's the change to sig hash to remove the quadra quadratic hashing issue. And of course, if you're creating a new kind of transaction format, you would put that fix in. Um, for the next soft fork, I believe the most likely proposal will be Schnorr signatures plus taproot plus perhaps SIG hash no input. And those are three different things. Um, so that, that is a bundling. Taproot you could leave out, but it's, it's so nice, why not put it in? It's, and it's, if you don't have the masked version of Taproot, it's, it's not that difficult. It's not much additional beyond Schnorr. Uh, it's benefits for Lightning and potentially other use cases. So if you're gonna do a soft fork, why not, why not just do it at the same time? Um, you know, the argument against is, if you put too much in, everyone will find something that they don't like and, and you'll get stalemate. But if you're making a change and it's 
it's a protocol change and it, it's difficult to do that. Just maybe just do it, just do it all at once. Um, I mean, not all, because we won't get graph root, we won't get signature aggregation. Um, those are bigger things, but Schnorr plus taproot plus Ccash no input is manageable and they're all good, good things. So let's just put them in. So you didn't talk about Django Labs. Um, oh, yeah. Like yeah, I can, I, I can talk a bit about that. Yeah. Um, so I said that we were a non-commercial research and development lab. Um, basically, it's just some, some guys in a room. Um, we have two founders, Alex and Suhas. Um, they are independently wealthy and um, like Bitcoin and want to fund development. So they fund us. There's five employees and we work on whatever we think is important in Bitcoin. Most of the time that is contributing to Bitcoin Core. So we write code, we test code, we review code. Um, we have one of the Bitcoin Core maintainers works at chain code. But really we have a lot of freedom to do whatever we think is important for Bitcoin um, in, in the widest sense. So one thing that we've done is a residency. Um, we've actually run two of these. I went to the first one and I, I learned about Bitcoin development and Bitcoin core development back in 2016. And then we ran another one earlier this year in 2018. Um, we invited people to apply to come and, and work on Bitcoin, Bitcoin Core for a month and work on their own projects and learn, work with us. We had speakers come in, we led talks. Um, we'll have something similar coming up. We're working on it. Um, so watch this space. Another thing I've done um, whilst I've been at Chaincode is, is called Bitcoin Optech. And we, the aim behind Optech is to encourage and help Bitcoin businesses use better scaling techniques and technologies. Um, so some of the guys in this room know about all about this already. Um, we got some funding from John Pfeffer and from Wences Casares to, to get this off the ground. It, again, it's non-commercial. We don't intend to make any money from it. And we, we do a bunch of things. Um, we have a newsletter, we run workshops, uh, we talk to companies and try and figure out what they're doing on the blockchain. So if they're not using SegWit, why not? And if they're not batching transactions, why not? Um, we're in the process of making a scaling cookbook or documentation on these scaling technologies, things like RBF and CPFP, where is it appropriate to use those things for fee bumping? Um, we have a forum online, we have a website, and we have a dashboard. Um, so we've, we've taken meetings with a bunch of companies, exchanges, custodians, wallets. Um, we just talk to, them, talk to them about the technology stacks they're using and their pain points, things like that. Uh, we've had one workshop so far in San Francisco. We're planning another one in Paris in November, but we don't have a date or an agenda yet. Uh, we produce the best technical newsletter in Bitcoin. Um, and I can say that because I don't write it. David Harding writes it. And David Harding is the best technical writer in Bitcoin. And these are, these are really good. Um, does anyone read the top 10 newsletter? Adam? Yep. Cool. Um, so you can go on the website and sign up for that. It's free. And it tells you everything that's going on in Bitcoin that week. Everything technical. Um, this is a work in progress, so we don't have anything yet. But we, we will create documentation around scaling technologies. So first chapter will be RBF, CPFP. We'll also add things like coin selection, fee estimation. As we move forwards and Lightning matures, we might do something on Lightning integration. If Schnorr comes along, we might do something on Schnorr, that kind of thing. Uh, we have an engineer forum for engineers at our member companies. Uh, we've got a website. And um, we've had an intern working on a dashboard for looking at like metrics for the health of the Bitcoin network. So you know, how many transactions are being produced that are uneconomical? How many outputs are being produced that are uneconomical to spend at different fee levels? Um, how many transactions are using RBF? How many are using SegWit, native SegWit, nested SegWit? Um, that kind of thing. Uh, OK, that's everything. So. Those are the kind of projects that, that we work on. Um, yeah. What was the reasoning behind setting up Bitcoin Optech? Could the Chainpad Labs not have done what they said we're trying to do? Um, it's a separate project. 
uh, Chaincode Labs is not set up really to engage companies. We ask our companies for member contributions. They're, they're pretty modest, but Chaincode is not set up to receive money coming in. It just <laughs> it just pays its employees. Um, so it's a separate project. It has separate funding. Um, you know, we, we have generous donations from John and, and Wences to set it up. So we just created this, this LLC to, to house that project. Can I ask you, is there any, like, you mentioned, like, any sort of positive sort of feedback from these uh, companies at all yet? Or, like, people are interested in implementing it? Or? People are certainly looking at it. Yeah. Um, I'd say the most advanced is bit refill. They're, they're, oh, yeah. they're receiving payments on mainnet with Lightning. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're way ahead. I, I think other exchanges are looking at it. I know, you know, I know people have Lightning nodes stood up in labs, but it's still, it's still not very mature. Yeah. Um, it'll take time. Yeah. Your views on protocol log change since engaging with companies as part of the Protocol development change. Well, so obviously they have a different perspective on what should be built on the protocol or basic development or just general culture and seeing it from their perspective on certain issues. Have your own views changed or have you just been educating them? No, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, usually the will is there amongst the engineers to do the right thing. Um, so companies that aren't, haven't implemented batching, it's not because the engineers don't want to do that, it's because um, they have priorities, and those priorities might be you know, make sure their entire platform scales because they're, they've got 50,000 signups every week and, and they need to make sure that their systems scale. Um, or it might be that they have leg legacy infrastructure and their system was built in such a way that if they wanted to implement batching, it would mean refactoring their entire code base. And, um, it's a three month job. Most of the, well, there's a selection bias. The companies that have talked to us want to talk to us, but amongst those companies, there are you know, so-called villains like Coinbase, who a lot of people were frustrated with because they didn't implement SegWit for a long time, didn't implement patching, but they're very engaged with us, and it, it feels like they want to do the right thing. Um, no one's asked us to implement a hard fork for them yet. Yeah, just in the history. Please. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So the, the original idea um, was floated on a, you know, on a list or basically a, a bit, but you know, list by Adam back um, in December, or the, you know, after the, the, the QX uh, war. It was, and I think he posted a meeting as well, so you can probably find the find it. And, and it was basically the, you know, he said the sort of the Bitcoin scaling challenge. How do we? Uh, there's so much uh, that we can do within. The, you know, the what we have that isn't being implemented properly. Um, if we could you know, get companies and developers to engage more and so forth, we can implement that and be transformative. It was a fabulous idea, and, uh, and uh, um, I called Vince Casares, who I don't know if you all know who he is, before, and, and I said, Vince, we have, you know, we start, we can do offer to provide some funding for this, and it's like, yeah, great idea. So we sort of replied all, saying, that's great. We'll, 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 we'll fund, you know, we'll provide funding for this. Uh, and then it sort of was quiet for three months, maybe. Yeah. Um, at least at least from, you know, in terms of Jim and John raised his hand and said, I'll need this. That was a critical thing, right, uh, in terms of making it actually happen. And, uh, and you know, it's amazing. Uh, I think what's been done. So uh, it's an exciting initiative. And I also think, I mean, and I'm an outsider, I'm an investor, right? And, and, um, but um, an example of um, just how much opportunity there is to you know, do what you want in Bitcoin. You know, if you if you have a good idea or a willingness to lead something that needs to be done, um, there are lots of other folks who you know in their own way want to want to help. You know, our, in my modest way, it's it's it's, it's funding uh, for, for for this great project. And, I mean, it, it's I think a terrific example of how much opportunity there is to. To, to sort of pick whatever it is you're interested in and, and get a group around it. Yep. So there's a question for both of you. Um, so given that, a, that this idea was founded on scale and scale adoption, 
would that extend to other other concerns or other things within the Bitcoin ecosystem, to privacy concerns and um, lightning adoption concerns, or, or whatever? Like as the ecosystem changes, okay. do, do you see this sort of going beyond the scale question, or is everything scale? Well, scale is uh, um, scale is an easy sell, right? Because it's everyone wins, um, really. For Bitcoin to work, it needs to be incentive compatible, and, and and that means companies should be incentivized to use the resource efficiently. Um, in the short run, maybe that's not true because they have competing priorities. But in the long run, you'd hope that companies would be on board with this, um, and it's good for the ecosystem as a whole. Privacy is, you know, we we want privacy, but it's not such an easy sell because companies. I think companies should be very concerned about privacy, but maybe they're not for whatever reason. Um, Lightning integration, I think, is foremost about scale. Lightning is a way that we... So the stuff that I've talked about are like these incremental wins. And for the short and medium term, that's good because it takes some of the pressure off. And hopefully, next time we get a November 2017 event where transaction throughput goes way up, Having these small wins will take some of that pressure off. But for the order of magnitude scale, we need something like lightning. Maybe it is lightning, maybe it's something different. So that's certainly, I would say that's within our wheelhouse if, if we can help with that integration and, and get adoption up. Uh, we, we want to try very hard not to be a Bitcoin foundation. You know, we're not, we don't want to place ourselves and say that we're the authority on you know, we're who companies, the only people companies should be talking to. Um, so we've got this kind of, we have a limited um, scope and that's in terms of the technical scope and in terms of the time horizons. We're, you know, we're doing this for the first year and we're, we're seeing how it goes. And if it's positive and beneficial, then we may continue, but we don't want to say, okay, Optech is, we're the guys you talk to and we make changes to the protocol or you know, anything stupid like that. John, did you? No, I agree. How disruptive do you think Lightning will be to, say, perhaps the exchanges? Like, is it an innovator's dilemma type situation um, where the incumbents are building infrastructure that. They can't move fast enough. Uh, I, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, if, if you're an exchange, then you should be running Lightning right now, and you should have it in your labs, and you should be offering betas to your customers, and you should be trying to, trying to win that race. Um, whether they will or not, that's really up to them. Um, and Lightning still is beta, it's still rough around the edges, and it still might not live up to its promise. But I think, I think anyone with an interest in Bitcoin should be looking at it and working on it and hacking on it and trying to figure out how it fits in with their business. Have you given a lot of thought to Lightning and follow it closely or some of the us, maybe James or some of the James at Bitcoin Optimum? Yeah, from, from a high level, from a high level. Um, I haven't contributed any code to LND or C Lightning or any of the other implementations. James has. Uh, Matt Corrado has written his own implementation from scratch, of course. Um, but yeah, I think everyone, everyone with an interest in Bitcoin should be looking at it, at least from a high level, um, and thinking about how it changes Bitcoin. Because it, it does. It's a, it's a different model. Um, I think it's great, and it's how we scale. Um, but it, yeah, everyone should be looking at it. I don't know, are, are you guys in the room? Are you all looking at Lightning? Running, Running it? Mainnet? Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Testnet's been really horrible now. Can we, can we talk about that? Actually? Okay. Can we talk about how awful Testnet is. And yet it does it half the time, doesn't mind segue, and then it doesn't mind, and it switches to that, what is that, that would be 20 seconds? Fixed time, 20 minutes, something? Yeah. It's just awful. It's way too big. What, what, what's happening there? I personally hold you, hold you Yeah, it's, it's definitely my fault. Um, yeah, 
yeah, it's got some strange behavior. Yeah. Um, I mean, contributions welcome if you want to start Testnet 4. Yeah, that's a thought, isn't it? I guess no one has been that annoyed by it to start a new yeah. Testnet. Seems, seems strange. So what's the behavior due to it? It's just people pointing hash power. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the hash power is very variable. And there's a special rule on testnet where if a block hasn't been discovered for 20 minutes, the next block is difficulty one. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I think that's the rule. And if that happens on a retarget boundary, then it's difficulty one for the rest of that. Right, yeah, yeah. That the next 2016 blocks, and then it's difficulty four because it can only change by a factor of four. Um, I think that's the bug. Um, but it, yeah, that means that Block time is very variable, and someone might point some hash power at testnet and not mine any transaction, uh, segwit transactions, yeah. because they can. Yeah. If I can find you on the net, I've been running for months, and I have lost a single thing. Uh, sometimes there are some bullets, and you get locked up for a while. can go to a shed, I use it running in Claire. The guys are very friendly. And they even write some custom code to recover your funds due to some fees or the problem. So it's very nice. It's very nice because you test across lots of stuff. There are dozens of services you can use, consume. So it goes from roulette, uh, gambling, betting, and buy t shirts, stickers. It's quite it's a lot. You can draw things yes. on Satoshi's face. The only thing is receiving. The receiving point is not trivial. You might want, you might think, okay, I have a, I open a channel and send a receiver. You need to uh, think about paying first. You need to spend a lot to receive. receiver. There's a certain balance. Yeah. But it's not, it's not something no show stoppers. And I would just recommend you go to mainnet and help Destiny. And it's fun. And it's nice. Yeah. And the second bit on every, on every point, it's if you're just spending it. Right. It's a lot better than people think. Of course, it's not perfect. It's a long way from perfect, but it's, there's a lot of different things you can buy. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Give it a try. But Great. Receiving is like, that's not, not trivial. Because of the uh, channel balance. Yeah, you need capacity. So, yeah. you need inbound capacity. So, yeah, you need capacity on the other side of the channel to in order to receive. Yeah. Do you think the development of philosophy on life will be very different to the kind? Obviously, conservatism is pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, when you're building on top of Bitcoin, you can build whatever you want. And if, if you're transacting with a single person, you can change your implementation. You can do, you, you're free to do whatever you want, um, which is very different from a consensus system where you can't make a change unless everyone agrees. Right? So, yeah, that, that velocity of changes can be a lot higher. Um, you know, we could see different, different versions of the Lightning Network running in parallel, people building other second layer solutions, people building on top of the Lightning Network. So yeah, it's, it's a lot more like a traditional, any other traditional software where it doesn't matter what other people are doing. Um, you can just build what you want to build. And that's fun. Do you think that there, are, there might be a culture clash in the future where, so it looks like there won't be a problem with stick hash in the input, or hopefully, probably, but it won't be a problem. But if layer two devs want to do various other things, like, do you, do you foresee a culture clash, in, culture clash in the future between and introducing new features on that base layer to allow new features on that second layer? I know. I, I think Bitcoin will become more and more difficult to change. Um, we'll get sh I hope we'll get Schnorr in. I hope we'll get Taproot. I hope we'll get Graftroot. Um, but beyond that, I don't know. I mean, I, as it, if Bitcoin adoption increases and there are more stakeholders and more users, then the inertia of that system increases. And to get change into that system becomes more difficult. So I expect we'll see the protocol solidifying over the next few years. I don't know. Maybe that's not true. Maybe people will keep 
forking and it will degenerate that way. I don't know, but um, I, I can't see anyone coming in and because of a, a layer two application being successful in, in changing the project. I don't know. So perhaps the Bitcoin ecosystem needs more developers on layer two, but perhaps doesn't require too many more developers on that layer. Maybe, maybe. I mean, y yes, I think that's true. I think, um, yeah, there'll be a lot more activity on the second layers and building on top of those second layers, building applications on top of Lightning is where we'll see, like, hopefully this Cambrian explosion of, of new ideas and new applications. Um, I'm really excited about it. I think a lot of the application excitement around dApps and Ethereum is built on an unsolid foundation, and it'd be nice if that excitement could get transferred to building on top of Lightning. I think that's possible. I, I see that as something that probably will happen over the next two years, um, and that would be really cool because we'll see like, more Satoshi's places and and actual use cases, real use cases for for Bitcoin, where people are doing exciting new things that we can't imagine ourselves. Perhaps even some of the core developers will move to layer two. Yeah. Well. Certainly, certainly. But um, it's a different, perhaps it's a somewhat different skill set. Um, Bitcoin protocol development is, can be a little bit scary, I guess, because protocol development is hard. And if you make a mistake, or if, if as a collective we make a mistake, then we burn a $100 billion ecosystem. or economy um, and maybe a lot of developers are not up for that maybe they prefer making applications and making great user experiences and if we have a platform like lightning on top of which they can make applications with great user experience then we'll get a whole bunch of people who would not be Bitcoin protocol development building on top of Bitcoin that's what's exciting I think cool. Any other questions? <laughs> first one, first one. Some there are some companies building on top of Bitcoin Cash that they are advocating zero confidence transactions, and they argue that uh, it's not perfectly safe, but it's safe enough for let's say small transactions. Yeah. What are your view about that? Um, do you agree that it's good enough to? I don't think it's a system that you should build an economy on top of. I think in certain cases, maybe zero conf is appropriate for your use case. But if everyone is always accepting zero conf, then you don't need a blockchain. Right? You, just, you just connect to every peer and listen for the first transaction, and that's good enough for you. That's up. Pardon? Like send a transaction via WhatsApp. Yeah. Shift. Yeah, Bitcoin. The blockchain, all of this infrastructure, this ridiculous proof of work thing, exists to solve the double spend problem. And if you ignore that that exists, which is what you're doing when you accept zero conf, then you don't need a blockchain. I, th I think it's degenerate and it's, it's silly. Um, so, yeah, I don't have much sympathy for that viewpoint. So, in practice, what would happen? Is it easy to? a double spend with zero conf, can you easily reproduce a double spend or does it take some yep. if you broadcast two transactions at the same time? Yep. You can get away with it easily. Peter Todd does it, Alex Bosworth has done it on BCH. Um, yeah, it's if you if you don't wait for a transaction to be in a block, there's no work on it and it can be reversed or changed. That's that's it. You're, the person sending you could bribe a miner to put a double spend in to the next block. But, yeah. And the other one is about the critical vulnerability discovered recently on Bitcoin Cash by one of the core developers. Mm -hmm. If it were you, what would, you <laughs> about, what would be your attitude towards that? Do you disclose in private? Do you give it be? Exploit. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I, I wouldn't exploit it because I have better things to do with my time and that may be illegal. Um, it depends. I, I yeah, I mean, I've, I've disclosed a bug to um, the Bitcoin Cash developers or a vulnerability in the past. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not that interested in the BCH project. I don't spend time looking at it. Um, more interested in building something on Bitcoin and building something on the best system or the best cryptocurrency that I'm, I'm aware of and the most exciting projects. And that's, for me, that's Bitcoin. So I think Corey Field said in his write up that, like, um, it's just interesting to see how other people have uh, implemented something on a different coin. So perhaps yeah. there's like educational opportunities or different challenges to your existing thoughts by looking at all coins. For you personally, I see much benefit in monitoring and developing other coins. Yeah, so in, in that article, Corey talked about how he, because these projects are forked from Bitcoin Core, um, he, when they have a release, he looks through their PRs to see if there are any bug fixes that might be appropriate for upstreaming or, or whatever. Um, I don't do that because I have a hard enough time keeping up with Bitcoin. I can't, I can't possibly keep up with all of the activity in Bitcoin Core, as you saw. Like three PRs get merged per day, three or four. I, I can't keep up with that and read the Bitcoin dev mailing list and read the Bitcoin Core dev IRC. I, I don't have time. And I think the most exciting stuff is happening in and around Bitcoin, Bitcoin Core. So that's where I focus my attention. One core developer who will remain nameless, I think, complained that uh, Bitcoin core developers are basically doing a lot of free consulting for Bitcoin Cash. Yes. Give me like 100 grand or something. What's that? Uh, Queen Geek have begun to pay you like 100 grand. In BCH. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that $100,000 of BCH at the time of the disclosure? No. <laughs> <laughs> Now, that obviously doesn't mean it's definitely guaranteed and there has to be consensus around it. Yep. But do you also think like that? Do you, do you see an end point for Bitcoin or some point in the future where you're like, we need this, we need this, we need this, we need this in the right order, yeah. um, and then we'll have discussions as a group around what order it should be, and then we'll try and get consensus from the community. Because it's not just a case of complete randomness, sure. uh, things getting thrown together, and let's just hope we get to the right point in three to five years. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, roadmap is maybe not the right word, vision or philosophy. Um, and my idea, and it's not my idea, it's nothing is original in Bitcoin, but the way I would like Bitcoin to develop is to be um, a blockchain as validator rather than blockchain as executor. Right, so uh, Bitcoin does um, both at the moment. It runs a script every time there's a transaction input. So it runs through the steps of the script. That's executing a program. And Ethereum takes that model and moves it more towards the execution side where you can execute a Turing complete program and you can store data on the blockchain. And fundamentally, I don't think that scales. If you go in the other direction, you get a blockchain as a, a validator and Taproot, for example, is an example of, of that. Um, where you have some kind of logic off the blockchain, but it collapses down to a single signature. And all the blockchain is doing is validating that signature. What, what lies behind that is immaterial to the blockchain. It's immaterial to everyone else on the network. Uh, Lightning is another example because a single transaction on the blockchain is encapsulating tens or hundreds or thousands of unique payments, but no one else needs to know about that. So when you, if you move to a blockchain as a validator, that scales a lot better. Checking signatures is quick compared to running arbitrary code. And having batch validation of signatures is quicker still. So if, it, if everything collapses down to signatures, then you get this really scalable system. And it's better for privacy, it's better for fungibility, and it scales. And that's, that's the direction that I think it should move. Like Ethereum's gone in that direction and, you know, Good luck to them, whatever they want to do. But I think the way 
that you scale a system like Bitcoin, which is fundamentally unscalable by itself, is by having the blockchain simply as a validator and then hiding everything behind signatures, for example. Um, so that's, that's where I want it to go. Mm -hmm. Taproot moves in that direction, Lightning moves in that direction. Um, and you know, who knows whether we'll get there, but I think that's philosophically where we should be headed. Is that thought that you need to get certain things in before the second layer matures or before even the third layer starts to be thought about? No, um, cause we're, build we're building, I mean, we, second layer solutions are being built now and they could be better with Sikash no input, they could be better with Schnorr signatures, but layer two is moving forwards, layer one is moving forwards in parallel. Things on top of layer two will also move forwards. Um, but as long as it's all in that direction of, of the blockchain being simple and as scalable as it can be as a blockchain, then we're good. We're moving in the right direction, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you.